You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. You've had a long day at work, and you can't wait to just get home, take off your shoes, plop yourself down in your favorite chair, and relax. Ah. You walk up to your tranquil residential home and your neatly manicured lawn in your quiet suburban neighborhood, put the key in the lock, open the door, and... Yes, the pets have gone wild! What were you thinking? Welcome to the show about everything you always wanted to know about exotic pets. Where to get them, what to feed them, and how to care for them. You'll even find out why some people live with a monkey. Now, here's your host, exotic pet expert and author, Bob Tart. Hey, Bob, what were you thinking? Hi, welcome to What Were You Thinking?, I'm Bob Tart, author of Enslaved by Ducks and Foul Weather, and I'm here with my wife, Linda. Hello. Uh, I did want to mention uh, that last week, again on Amazon, Enslaved by Ducks was the number one best-selling pet bird book, and so I want to thank everybody for that. Thank you. A couple of weeks ago, we did a show on the topic of what to do if you find a baby bird. I opened the show in front of the cage downstairs when we had just gotten six baby flickers, and flickers are a kind of woodpecker, and at that time neither of us knew what we were in for, did we? No, we didn't. So we're going to do a show this week telling you what happened with those flickers, and you might think, how can anybody possibly do a half hour about just raising a few woodpeckers? Well, believe me, it was quite an experience. Easy. Yeah. So... We got those birds from Peg Markle at Wildlife Rehab Center. And Peg, did she call us about them, or, or how did that happen? I think so. She had four, and then she was waiting for two more to come from Muskegon or something. And then when you went over there, she finally had the total of six of them. That's right. I think she told me that in one case, th- these look like pretty adult birds, but they acted very babyish. And in one case, the tree had actually been cut down. They didn't know that there was wood. No. They didn't know they were in there. there was a woodpecker nest inside and something happened to the parents. And so anyway, we ended up with six flickers and we had never raised them before. We'd have, we'd had one or two woodpeckers at a time. I remember we have talked about uh, a red belly woodpecker we had last year named Big Boy and he was an absolute pleasure. We love him. We still see him. And I think if we had had one or two flickers, that would have been an absolute pleasure too. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's different when you have six and ultimately seven. We'll tell you how we got the seventh one. But why don't you describe a little bit what it was like dealing with six and ultimately seven flickers in that flight cage in the basement? Well, did we have them down there right in the beginning or did we have them in the back room? We had them in the back room, but just talk about their personality. They started out in the back room in this one cage we have that's a pretty good size cage, but not huge. And then they were quickly transferred to this cage we have downstairs that we call the flight cage. It's in the basement, and it's a long, it's probably, what, four or five feet long. And how tall would you say it is? About four couple, feet? No, just a couple feet tall, but there's a room it's enough. It's long. It's quite roomy. So it gives them a sense of being able to learn how to, to fly back and forth. It's very roomy, and they really they enjoy that. You must have said something to upset Harvey. I hear our, our parakeet <laughs> is getting his two cents in. <laughs> so anyway, they were together down there, and we made up our typical slurry mixture, which we talked about in another show that has the kitten chow chicken baby food, water, and a tiny bit of liquid uh, children's vitamins put in a blender. That's what we've been feeding them. And um, so they were down there, and so every couple hours or less than that, actually, I would go down to feed them. Now we've com- and they were happy with that. We might, might have mentioned and or complained in the past what it's like dealing with starlings because starlings are birds that are they're pretty fun to raise if you have youngsters um i mean if you have the young starlings they're pretty fun to raise but they're demanding aren't they they're loud and big eaters yeah the, you you will practically get deafened after a while if you if you have uh, four five or six starlings mm-hmm. and you have to put your head close to them mm-hmm. but these flickers were pretty exuberant. number one biggest eaters of any of the including starlings yeah yeah, they, in fact, they made us a little bit nostalgic for the starlings. <laughs> they eat so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We would hear them calling us. They have a real sharp kind of a um, call note. It's kind of like they're saying clear, clear. Um, 
and you can probably find a sample of that on the web. Or, or listen to our show on Raising Baby Birds. At the very beginning, you can hear what they yeah, sound There's no like. way to get away from it anywhere on the property because it's such a, a piercing kind of a sound. Yeah, you can when, hear it from anywhere on the property, yeah, including when, out in the barn. So you can imagine what it's like Can't when, get when, away they're, from it. when they're in the house. Mm-hmm. So we had six of them, and it was kind of coming along, but we didn't really know what to do with them because you have to get them to the point where they're eating on their own. And we didn't really know how to do it because they wouldn't eat suet. The other woodpeckers that we've raised, yeah, that was a lot easier that we way. We got them to eat suet by putting it inside the flight cage, and that's what we did with these. We put the suet inside there in a block in one of those wire cages. And with the woodpeckers, if you put it over near one of the upright logs, they eventually went up and started eating it. Not these things; they weren't the least bit interested. No, they in had it. no interest no, in it whatsoever. None. I mean, you could stick it in their mouth; they would eat it. But as far as on their own trying to eat that, uh uh-uh, no. So we got some unexpected help. And what happened was I posted a picture of the six flickers in a tub. I had them in a tub briefly while Linda was cleaning their cage. And I took a photo of that because it was funny to see. And I posted it on this um, birding list serve. It's an email group that I'm a member of in Michigan. And it just happens that one of the people on there is a wildlife rehabber. And she emailed me right away, and she said that she had a flicker, and she was going out of town. She was going to the Gas Bay Peninsula on something to help birds, as I recall. And she wanted to know if she could drive up from Ann Arbor and give us the seventh flicker. And she would give us some tips on helping the flickers learn to eat on their own. So she came up uh, this is sherry and sherry drove up and uh she had a really good idea um we went out into our woods she'd been doing rehabbing for was it 30 years 20 30 years so she was yeah, very knowledgeable years. about how to do things yeah it was real fun talking birds. to sherry yeah yeah she's a very smart lady so uh sherry and i went out in the woods and she had a particular kind of log she wanted us to find and these were ones that um, kind of rotted yeah, she said they were ones that carpenter ants had really gnawed into. And you'd pick up a fairly good-sized log, and it wouldn't weigh a thing. And it, they, it had been kind of carved into uh, not even very log-like really shape. Really soft. Really soft and uh, lots of uh, crevices and crags. So we brought a few of those back and um, put them... She put a string so that one was... Uh, two strings, kind of a cradle, and we hung one up in our outdoor flight cage. Yeah, I was really surprised those strings would hold that thing. It was quite a sizable piece of wood. And it didn't weigh a thing. And they had it horizontally in this outside release cage, and I I just couldn't believe those strings would hold it, but that's how light it was. And her idea, which was correct, was that flickers like those kinds of trees out in nature or those kinds of pieces of wood, and they peck at them and they find insects. So what you need to do to get them to eat on their own is to provide some food and press it in the crevices and cracks of those rotten logs. And she, what she feeds them is she takes um, raw nuts, and these are nuts without the shell, shelled uh, peanuts and shelled sunflower seed. She takes one part of those, one part of science diet cat food, and grinds it up in a blender and she has a little pinch of calcium citrate for vitamins for them. And then you get this mixture, it's powdery, but it's a little bit a little bit gluey too because of it. the nuts. Yeah. You know, it's almost, it gets There's a little, oils little in the nuts. peanut buttery. Right. And so we press those in the cracks of the logs and also we cut up some um, grapes really finely and some vegetables and put those out there and um, took a while. It took a long time. For some reason, they just didn't get onto it right away. Because they love that slurry so much. Yeah, they want to be fed. That's, That's what happens. Yeah, with they're like babies they, with a bottle. They just prefer to be fed. Mm-hmm. But finally, after, was long it time. maybe 10 days or not quite that long, yeah. uh, I went out there and I saw some of them eating. And... Um, they try to do it on the sly so you won't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but we saw some of the flickers eating and so... Uh, finally, Linda decided also that enough was enough because they get to the point where they hate being in the flight cage. They're screaming all the time. They're flying around like crazy. And the ironic part is it's the same thing every year 
that the time when you feel they need to go the most is a time that's not appropriate because of weather. Like if there's an, a storm, you have to watch their weather reports. If there's a storm going to be coming up within the next couple days or so, you're not supposed to release them before the time of a storm because it would be too traumatic for them to be released at that time. So it never fails that if I get a batch of birds that's going crazy inside this release cage, really wants out more than anything in the world, there's going to be a storm the next day, that day, or the day after that. So you feel like even though they're just getting psychotic in there, you really shouldn't release them. So as is, was always the case, that's what happened with these. And I think there was going to be a four-day stretch where there was a chance of a storm every single day. And this was the point where they were just flying around, flapping against the wire. The tail was even getting messed up on one of them. And they really needed to go, but we didn't feel we could. But the weather did straighten out by the Saturday of that week, and we did release four of them that day and three the next day. Right, so all seven of them were, were released. Or by Sunday <clears throat> of that week, which is what, two weeks ago? Yeah, Sunday. yeah. Now, ideally, you would probably want to wait to release birds until you know for sure they're all eating. Yeah, you on have their own. to wait. You can see they've got to be all eating on their own. But we didn't know if they all were, but our idea some was of them that we were. some that we would release them and the ones that couldn't fend for themselves. We figured Would maybe probably come back. Maybe they always come do. back for food. They, and, they um, always do. I talked to Dr. Bennett, who is the um, former zoo vet at the John Ball Park Zoo in Grand Rapids, and he's heavily involved in animal rehab with Wildlife Rehab Center in Grand Rapids. And I said, is that a good way to do it with birds that um, release them once they get to this really frustrated, frantic point? so that if they need help, they can come back and get food. And he said, absolutely. So it, it, was, the right, it worked out fine. was the right thing to do. So we were thinking maybe, just maybe, the birds would come back. Well, three of them disappeared, which Instantly. is a good thing. They, they just, were kind of, there were some that were kind of wild yep. acting. However, four started coming around for handouts. And boy, did they come around, didn't mm -hmm. they? Pretty much every, well, they were just lounging around the yard all day long, just waiting for somebody to step out the door. Yeah, and you would hear them. It wouldn't matter whether you go out the front door or the back door or the side door, and you can pretty much hear them and see them all over the yard. And, and, and it was swooping down. It was pretty fun for a while because you would, um, we'd go out to this uh, large, uh, is that a hackberry tree? Yes. It's just about uh, 10, 15 paces out the back door. And then suddenly four flickers would appear, and they'd all gather on the trunk or on one of the limbs. And, of course, they have this frustrating habit of never quite coming low enough to be fed. Yeah, that's what was funny about it. So you have to step up on a chair. And even then, even up as short as I am, I would reach as far as I could reach up on where this branch was. And they were at the, what do you call that, the crux of where the first branch comes out. And they would get back just about three, four inches past where I could reach. Although they wanted the food really bad, yeah. but they didn't have the sense enough to come forward to get it. Yeah, it's funny. They'd be smart enough to come in to fly to in. To the tree. Follow us around the yard either. And even. get within three inches of the syringe. But then didn't want to go in. I, I don't get that. Closer. I don't get that. But at least um, it was going pretty well because they would come all the time and they would get fed yeah. and w we could feed yeah, them. Yeah, every hour on the hour, every two hours. But then came... Little surprises. Yeah, there was a uh, Tuesday of uh, two weeks ago now, I guess, and I was outside feeding the four and I was thinking, you know, how good they were doing. It was in the doing. evening, early evening. Uh, yes, it was. Late it was afternoon, about five early evening. And all four were there. And um, three of them were down on the hill. They just hopped down on the ground after I'd fed them. I was feeding the fourth one, and all of a sudden I saw a shadow of a bird come by. I couldn't see what it was. It came out of the brush. I'm assuming it was a small hawk because so, it scared the heck out of them. Yeah. And they scattered, and one of them flew extremely fast and rammed right into, the, rammed goose into the duck pen, the goose pen. Yep. And I could really hear it. He yep. really hit it hard. Yep. And I went out to look at him, and the poor guy was Didn't just right. hanging there without moving, breathing really hard, kind of making funny little sounds. And I went and I um, picked him up and carried him and put him back in the flight cage, and he looked really bad. Yeah, he, he come, Bob come upstairs and said, I don't know about this one. No, it doesn't uh -uh. look good No, he, he looked like he wouldn't last the night. We felt really bad about yeah. it because... And I was also afraid the hawk might have gotten one, 
and then also this one was a casualty. But it turned out later that the other three did come yeah, back. Yeah, Bob called me. He was out doing the uh, ducks, wasn't it, putting them in, and mm -hmm. he he came back on the deck and motioned to me through the window to look back at that tree, and there was the three standing mm -hmm. on the tree. So we're at least happy that we had the three. So we knew those three were all right. But we were very, very worried about this one. Very worried about them. And so, so we made an appointment for the vet for the next yeah, day. Yeah, Linda made an appointment with Dr. Bennett, and Dr. Bennett is... Uh, He's a very busy vet. Very, You couldn't find more of an expert anywhere, but he was kind enough to make space for me that day to bring in the birds. The, the bird. It the was, bird. It was just one bird. And uh, we have to break right now for a message from our sponsor, but after we get back, I will tell you what happened, and uh, we had some more surprises. Other coming. little surprises. Yeah, so uh, you are listening to What Were You Thinking? And we'll be right back. What Were You Thinking? We'll be right back after Bob gets the ducks out of his living room. Don't go away. Got a cool cat. Got a cool cool hat. Got a cool cat. Do you have a cool cat in the house? Well, of course I do. Got a camera? Then take a quick pic of your cool cat and enter the Pet Life Radio Cool Cat Contest. Pet Life Radio is partnering with Morris and Nine Lives to give you the chance to win a really cool cat care kit. Get a Nine Lives Play and Scratch Play Post, Nine Lives Wooly Cat Bed, Nine Lives Food Bowl, Morris Play Spinners, and much, much more. You'll also get an autographed copy of Pet Edutainer Arden Moore's new book, Happy Cat, Happy You. Now what cat wouldn't want that? Everybody gets a chance to vote. And the top five coolest cats win an awesome cool cat care kit from Pet Life Radio and Nine Lives. To enter, just go to the PetLifeRadio.com website or CoolCatContest.com. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No. To my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. world. Fluff your feathers, roll out your tongue, shine your fins, snap on your leashes, and grab your human. It's the Louisville Pet Lovers Expo. Two full days of pet-tastic fun that no pet lover should miss. Join us for shopping, the Barks and Couture Fashion Show, Dream Pet Wedding, Ultimate Pet Makeover, Pet Communicator, Rescue Me Pet Adoption, Service Dog Demonstration, and tons of fun contests. Bring your pets and join us at the Louisville Pet Lovers Expo, Saturday, September 27th, and Sunday, September September 28th at the Kentucky Expo Center. For more information, go to LouisvillePetExpo.com. Here's the story of a lovely lady who is bringing up three very lovely gulls. Join us every week on Wings and Things and get a bird's eye view of everything there is to know about pet birds and how to make your frequent flyer a happy camper. Wings and Things. That's the way we became the Birdie Bunch. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, ducks are in the pond, rabbits in his hutch, and monkeys... Ow! In my car! Oh, okay, all right. Go check my insurance policy. We'll turn you back over to Bob. Hi, welcome back to What Were You Thinking? And Linda and I are talking about our adventures raising seven orphan flickers. So, the next day, we were happy because I, uh, Linda was the first to tell me 
that the flicker was starting to look better, the one that rammed into Just a the, little better. Just a Walking little bit around better. a little bit. Yeah, because the night before, the most he could do was cling a little to the side. He really wasn't walking. He just looked terrible. He but was blinking his eyes and mm -hmm. looking unhappy. So I went out there probably a couple hours before I was going to take them to, to take him to Dr. Bennett, and I'm feeding him, and I'm hearing the other birds who want to be fed. I'm hearing three of them at first. So I go out with the syringe and I'm feeding two others. But the fourth one, suddenly he sounds distant. I'm thinking, where the heck did he go? But what was weird was that he still responded to my voice. It's like, well, how can he be far away when I'm calling him and he would call back? Was he there at first? Well, I heard three of them real clear at first. Oh, okay. So I walked up to the house and it sounded at first here, like, no? like he was in the walls of the house, and that was impossible. And then this really bad thought hit me. Huh. We have a, um, an old wood stove chimney. And I thought, no, he couldn't have couldn't. gone down the chimney. Once when we first moved into the house over, let's see, we moved in 1990, a red-bellied woodpecker had gone down that chimney. And it was came all the out way the, in the furnace. Yeah. but Not it, at a season when the fire No, was no, going. I just took him outside. Yeah. So I opened the um, clean-out door on the outside of the chimney and this uh, flicker that we'd call broken tail because somehow he had been so frantic in the flight cage broke that he broke the flight fe the um, tail feathers. Yeah. It's no big deal, they'll grow back. He came out <laughs> just covered in soot. <laughs> looked like a blackbird. Yeah, so I, yeah, he did. He, he looked like a grackle and yeah. we'll get into grackles in a minute. So I had to catch him because suddenly I had two birds to bring to Dr. Bennett's. Didn't and know what he, to do. You can't leave him like that. Oh, he was so filthy that just grabbing him, I looked at my hands afterwards, and I could hardly get the stuff off my hands. I took a, a wet washcloth and tried getting some of it off him, and it so didn't greasy. look So greasy. You can't get it off. So I took him to Dr. Bennett's, and it happened to be a day when we were getting a storm. One of the worst storms of the year. Yeah, which I didn't know. Now, we had had some storms clobber us early in June. About a month before. We didn't talk about that, but um, our power was Lost off. Lost our power, 48 hours, had to use a generator, no water, nothing. No, and um, when you live out in the country, when your power goes, your well goes too, so you have no water. Luckily, we had our generator, but with the price of gas what it is, you don't want to run a generator very much, so we just ran it a few hours a day. And then what happens is a week later, we got hit by another bad storm, and our power went off for 20 hours, and this time our generator broke. Yeah. We're still waiting for We it to ran get one thing too many. We had the stove and the microwave, and by putting something in the dryer and turning it on, that was it. But that wouldn't have happened unless something was wrong with it anyway. And in the first storm, tell them what happened with your computer. Yeah, it fried my computer. Totally up. fried his computer. Some and kind the, of a power and the answering surge. machine. Yeah, and um, I had a surge protector, but it wasn't a didn't good work. one. Mm -mm, no, it didn't do it. Luckily, I had a Mac, and it made it very easy for me to restore the data. But um, that that was a big mess. So, I took the birds to Dr. Bennett, and I barely made it there because the rain was coming down so much. The streets were flooded. Very badly, all and over town. Thousands of people without power. Dr. Bennett uh, gave me very good news about this flicker, the one that had hit the duck pen. He was looking better all the time, and Dr. Bennett said he had a mild concussion and to keep him a couple more days and he would be fine. So that was really that good, was news. good news. The bad news about Broken Tail, who we started from that point on calling Sooty, Bad news about Sooty was that we had to wash him. Yeah, Dr. Bennett didn't want the task. No, and his hands got all sooty just <laughs> holding sooty. So I had a real hard time getting home from the vet because I have never seen rain like that in my... You had to keep changing streets. Yeah, I'm 55 years old, and I don't recall ever seeing rain like this before. Yeah. And so many of the um, streets, streets in Grand Rapids were flooded, and you couldn't get anywhere. I had to end up going on the freeway and going miles and miles south to hook up with a, um, a freeway going west that I could find, yeah, work was, my way back yeah, to Lowell. I was really concerned about him getting time. home. It was something else. Yeah, it was bad. Thunder, lightning, crashing, booming. And almost as soon as I got home, I went outside and looked for the other two birds, and they were just soaked. Sopping one crap. of them was uh, the ones, the other two that had been wild, had been free, and one of them was just absolutely soaked and on the ground and couldn't even fly. So we put him in the outdoor flight cage. It's got a roof on it. And the other one I just pulled from a tree branch. He was miserable too, and we fed them both. And so suddenly we've got all four flickers back again. Uh -huh. So 
then came the real event of the day. Uh, do you want to describe washing sooty? We had to get a metal tub-like thing, uh, put some water with dishwashing liquid. We didn't have any Dawn. I know Dawn uh, dishwashing liquid is what they use for the birds that have gotten in the oil spills. I know that's the best, but we just used whatever kind we had. And it, it wasn't enough to wash him once. He had to be washed twice, and he just really was very unhappy with a capital U. He, um, he started shivering so convulsively. I just, you don't really like scaring birds that much because they can drop over dead just from fright. But he, he made it through it all right. And we had to blow dry him with a hair dryer, which he hated also, and he shivered all the way through that. You have never seen anything more pathetic oh than a bird. Oh my gosh. When They're just all. When they are wet. That when they much. don't have the feather well, the plastered against their skin like that, they just look like. He looked a like a, a little blob of meat with a skull. Nothing there, hardly. And you look at those feathers, and I thought we'd wrecked his feather somehow. They it didn't look awful. like anything that would ever come back to life yeah. again. But the blow drying was good because it, you know, we did it Fluffed on warm. Fluffed him back up. Yeah. We, we made sure he wasn't too hot. I always kept my hand down by him so that I could feel the temperature of the blow dryer so right. it wasn't too hot. And it took a long time, yep. but gradually his feathers started appearing Looking again. Looking normal again. He didn't, yeah. We probably got, what, 75% of it off. We, we couldn't get it all off. So that's so you got the name Sooty after that. Yep. So a few days later, um, a couple days later, Dr. Bennett said we should keep Sooty for a day or so because that would deplete the oils in his feathers when we use the dishwashing detergent. Might not on be him. able to fly. He might good. not be able to fly. But within was it that day or the next day we let them both go? Yes. And they did fine. They did fine. So. There's the four birds, and you think, well, then that's enough. They still have those four flickers to contend with when they're going outside because the flickers kept coming back. Although eventually two of them dropped out, and we only got down to yeah, two yeah, flickers. Yeah, now we got two. But that's not all we have to contend with, is it? Mm -mm. You want to talk about the Baltimore <clears throat> Oriole? That was at the same time, wasn't it, that we yeah. got the Baltimore yeah, Oriole? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when we got the flickers, we also got... Sh Shauna Gordon from Michigan Wildlife... Uh, center. She does not rehab any bird. She rehabs mammals and she doesn't have a license for birds. So she called me up and asked if we would take a little Baltimore Oriole who was in bad shape, an orphan one. So we started feeding him. And we were just saying him. It could be a her, but nice bird, but Beautiful the most babyish bird. little bird you'd ever see. It's very difficult to raise a bird on its own. It's It's so much easier when you have two or three or four of them because they know then how to start acting like a bird. If you've only got one, they tend to become very self-centered, uh, demanding, but also kind of babyish, and that's very difficult for them to get out of that babyish behavior and want to be out on their own. They get too dependent upon you, and it's a real problem. And physically, he was at the stage where he was long since due for release, because in the past we've had... I think we had three or four Baltimore Orioles one year, and you usually, about the time that their tail is it's about three quarters of the way in, they're ready to go. And now. this thing has a tail like four inches long, oh, yeah, three, he, really super long. Mm -hmm. It was ready to go, technically. But any time he saw us, he would flutter his wings real fast and open his beak and make like this Like a little tiny sound. baby. Yeah, like a little tiny baby bird. So it was hard to think about releasing him, but I, I knew he needed to be released. So we finally um, kind of bit the bullet. I was really afraid, but you know, what are you going to do? So we let him go, and he did pretty well as far as flying, didn't he? Fine. Mm -hmm. So he kept coming back for food, though. So now we've got two Baltimore, or we've got two flickers and a Baltimore Oriole coming back. But that wasn't quite enough, no. was it? No. Uh, Peg Markle of Wildlife Rehab Center came over just last Saturday, a week ago. And she brought a green heron to release on our property. And that went really well. We released the bird and never saw him again. It was a very healthy green heron. And we live on the river, so... Good place to release him. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she brought a couple of grackles. And she told us that... Uh, she thought they were red-winged blackbirds, but I can kind of understand that. If um, We had to look them up in the book because we didn't see... I've never seen juvenile grackles before. But we looked them up, and that's what they were. Well, actually, we had a couple last year. We had we? a couple years ago. We yeah. had one we named Jabba the Hutt. Yeah. So we found out why Pe Peg had said that she had released this bird in her yard, these two birds. They could eat on their own, but they kept they coming wouldn't. back for handouts. So her idea was that if they didn't see her anymore, 
that uh, they would away. they would get the food on their own. They wouldn't be that attached to us, and maybe they'd go off and be regular birds out in the wild. So you would think that... No such luck. No, you would think that a couple birds who were... Birds usually, if we have friends over when we're feeding birds that we've raised, they generally are skittish around anybody else. If, if A stranger usually, unless we're right there, a stranger can't really just go up and feed one of the birds that we release as a rule. So I never thought that these grackles would immediately bond, uh, with, us. bond with us and identify us with uh, food. But that's what happened, isn't it? Yeah, within what, a couple hours? Yeah. Less than that, probably. So suddenly, every time we go outside, at least um, within a couple hours of the last time we fed them, we have two flickers, a Baltimore Oriole, and two grackles One looking two grackles. for us. Yes, they, they and stalk us down. following us around the yard. Uh, I tried to go to the store uh, to Meyer down the street a couple days ago uh, after I came home from work, and I'm walking towards my car, and I'm dive bombed by all these. By I'm dive bombed by a couple flickers. A grackle lands on my car, mm -hmm. and then this little Oriole it flies to a tree right above me and starts twittering, 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 and then comes down and lands on me. Yeah, it lands right on my shoulder or my clothing mm -hmm. or my arm mm -hmm. or skirt or something. And sometimes uh, even tries to get in the car. Yes. So we got that to deal with. We had our uh, handyman Gary over a couple days ago to uh, work on our duck pen that uh, way last winter some ice fell down and uh, ruined it. really ruined our pen and we've been waiting for him to have time to come back and finish fixing it. And uh, we mentioned the flickers to Gary and he, he, Gary's a birder and he likes birds a lot. But um, t t uh, mention what you saw when you looked outside. Well, yeah, I was doing something in the kitchen during the period of time he was here. I looked out this big picture window that's in our dining room and I s saw him down the hill kneeling down near the vegetable garden and I saw the one of the birds, I couldn't tell which one it was, on the ground near him and he looked all delighted. And uh, so I went out there to see what was going on. Well, he there was a large stone near the corner of that vegetable garden. He had turned it over to see if there might be some ants under there. Sure enough, there was. He was trying to get those uh, flickers to see if they would eat those ants, and they had, which they hadn't really done much of so far. And he was thrilled to find that they were interested very much in those ants, and there was ant eggs and everything. Man. And the flickers were walking right up to him and right over to where the ants were, and he was just tickled to death to be able to get that close to those flickers and to be able to watch them eat those ants. Yeah, because so um, it's funny. We um, I've always considered myself really lucky to see flickers in the wild. I mean, they're not they're really they're not really rare birds by any means. They're a fairly common the woodpecker, time. but. Yeah. Yeah, but we always are, think it's fortunate when we see them. Oh, yeah, and you so, don't see them as much as red bellies or downies or no, any of those. I don't want to say we've gotten our fill of them, but um, oh, we've no. certainly had a, quite an experience Close of them. Close so, contact for several So that weeks. must have been really nice for Gary to come over and then just have that experience of having <laughs> these like tame that. flickers come yeah. up to him. So anyway, we, we hope they do well. Um, you know, we hope that the birds break themselves of us having to come out. We try not to come out so often and feed them because they can forage on their own. We've seen them eating. Even the little Baltimore Oriole, I've seen her pecking at um, leaves and at tree branches. So the instinct is there. And it we just don't, takes time. It, ju it just takes time. Um, I'm looking out the window right now, and you see who there that is. There sits the flicker yeah, there's on the Sooty. milk house. Mr. Sooty is waiting out there. for us to He's come out. He's waiting for us to come out, and I just saw another one out there, too. Yeah, we're and seeing hummingbirds. We have three hummingbird feeders, and they were very lucky that they've been coming up constantly to the three different feeders, one on one side of the house and two on another side. And they say if you, and there's a little squirrel on the window. You look through the, look through the pine tree, there's a grackle waiting for us. Oh, is he? Yeah. So we're surrounded by birds uh, at our place, which makes us happy. Now, a lot of times I'll be I'll be sitting upstairs in my office, and I'll know that the flickers want to be fed because they're making their call note, their I want to be fed note. Well, we had a new wrinkle today. I heard that call note, but it wasn't the flickers. It was Linda's African gray parrot, Dusty. <laughs> He's learned the call note of the flickers, and Dusty never loses the opportunity to torment us in some way with some sound if he can do it. <laughs> he calls Linda by name when he wants something, imitating my voice, so now we've got that to do. <laughs> Linda, with. Linda, Linda! So anyway, believe it or not, that's the whole half hour of our Flickr stories. 
And uh, anything else you want to say about them? I don't know, but they're, uh, as well as all the birds in the yard, I'm looking right now at this big, large, chubby, I don't know what you want to call him, overgrown woodchuck right over the hill, eating scratch feed on the hill with a little, is that a squirrel out there? So this is quite the wildlife haven. Aren't you glad we don't do mammal rehab? <laughs> there wouldn't be We'd any be room out there, for them. Out there feeding, how'd you like to feed a woodchuck all day? <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us on this all flicker episode of What Were You Thinking? Uh, again, I'd like to thank everyone who has bought my book and Slave by Ducks recently and yes, made it you. the number one best-selling pet bird book on Amazon. And also, I've been getting pretty good numbers on my second book, Fall Weather. Somehow on Amazon, they've classified that under the Dog, Cats, and Other Animals book, even though there's a duck on the cover and it's called Fall Weather. But um, thank you for everyone who has also bought Fall Weather. Both books are about our animals and our experience raising uh, some of the wild birds and also our experience with our pet ducks, geese, turkeys, hens, rabbits. A little bit everything. Yeah, you name it. So, thanks uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks to our producer. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thinking about buying a monkey? How about a ferret or a skunk? Then check out the show that will answer the burning questions, where do you get them? What do you feed them? How do you take care of them? And most of all, what were you thinking? With exotic pet expert and author Bob Tart, every week on demand from PetLifeRadio.com.